Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise. Raising up disciples who, through faith in God, will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. First Corinthians 12. Go quickly if you would. We are now looking at not massive detail because uh, in the times I've taught this before, I would basically take a service to deal with each one of these individual nine gifts. But because we're tying them to this series called The Power of Pentecost, we're kind of basically doing more of an of a overview of these gifts. So I've already given an initial overview of all nine. Now we're going through them a little further in detail because the Bible's clear. We need to understand these gifts so that we can see the power of God working in our life. The Holy Spirit is that power, and we know that this is a part of that because He is the one that distributes these gifts to us. 1 Corinthians 12.1 says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, say it with me, I do not want you to be ignorant. Say it again, I do not want you to be ignorant. So this is God, of course, talking to the Apostle Paul. So guess what God's saying? I don't want you, children of mine, to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. You need to understand them. You need to know what they are. You need to know how they function. Down in verse 7, he begins to talk about these gifts. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Nine gifts, three different categories. To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Verse 9, to another faith. That's the gift of faith, supernatural faith, not what we build by the word, but a manifestation gift again of the Spirit, supernatural faith by the same Spirit. To another comes gifts of healings. By the same Spirit, verse 10, to another, working of miracles, and to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, tongues, and different kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of those tongues. Verse 11, eat, but notice this, one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one. Each one. Say, we all have them. Each one. In other words, we all have the capability of functioning these gifts as He, as the Spirit Will. So we've talked on already in these categories of three different gifts. We've already covered the revelation gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, as well as discerning of spirits. Talked all about that. Now we're in the power gifts, gifts of power or divine energy. Revelation gifts do what? Reveal, Reveal something. Power gifts do what? They do something. They do something supernaturally. So we covered on Sunday, we actually covered the gifts of healings, uh, work, uh, the gifts of healings and the working of mir- uh, excuse me we uh, we covered the uh, gift of faith and the gifts of healings now we're going to look at working of miracles we didn't have time to get to that one so of the three power gifts we are on the final one C working of miracles what is a working of miracles good question it is a supernatural intervention by God supernatural intervention by God in the ordinary course of nature supernatural intervention by God in the ordinary course of nature. Things that in the ordinary course of nature could not happen normally without intervention by God supernaturally. And that can be in in a context of a lot of things in our life. So let's look at some examples as we're doing. I know we're looking at a lot of verses, but 1 Samuel, it it will do you good to get your eyes on these scriptures so you learn them. If you go over here to the book of 1 Samuel, we're going to start here with David. If you go to 1 Samuel, we're going to go to chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. Now this is the story, of course, where David faces Goliath. But in the midst of this story, how many remember he was at home? All of his brothers are at the, at the battlefront against the Philistines. Goliath, of course, comes out every day, you know, blows and goes and hollers and screams and everybody goes and runs and hides in their little foxholes. And uh, he goes and sits back down. And all of a sudden, uh, David's dad says, I want you to go to the battlefront. I want you to see how your brothers are doing. Take them some food because uh, they could probably use it. So David does. So he goes to the battlefront. 
As he goes to the battlefront, of course, he sees Goliath come out like they all, all had been day after day after day, seeing Goliath come out, appear out before all of those uh, children of Israel. And so basically scared and all that. And he's like, man, who is this uncircumcised Philistine, you know? So he clearly is kind of shocked that they're all hiding from him. And in the midst of him getting ready to go and battle this Philistine, he makes a powerful statement here. In 1 Samuel 17, 34, 17, 34, addressing Saul, the king at the time, king of Israel, he said, Saul, your servant used to keep the father's sheep. So Saul's agreed to let him go up against this giant. He says, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. Notice this. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it. Now let me tell you what you don't do normally. You don't chase lions and bears. You listening? It's not a normal operation. Not a normal operation. I went out after it and I struck it and I what? Delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and I killed it. You read it again. I went out after it. I struck it, delivered the lamb from its mouth. When it arose against me, I caught it by what? Its beard and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has also killed both the lion and the bear. That's not normal. Hands of everybody in here has ever killed a bear. Let me see your hand. I don't mean with a gun. I'm talking about bare hands. Anybody here, bare hands ever killed a lion? Never done that. Let me tell you what. Normally, in the context of what is known of hunting, this is not how you kill a lion, and this is not how you kill a bear. You don't do this with normal, regular human strength. You do not do so. You listening? So your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. Notice this. And this uncircumcised Philistine, verse 36, will be like one of them. I want you to listen carefully to what he's about to say. Seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. 37, here's the key. Watch. Moreover, David said, underline it, the Lord who delivered me. How did he kill the lion? How did he kill the bear? The Lord delivered me. Say miracle. You, you kill a lion or a bear with your bare hands and the Lord delivered you through that, that, that time frame, guess what? It was actually a miracle. This is God, once again, coming in through the, into the context of an ordinary course of nature and intervening supernaturally. Because this is not something you do naturally. So David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, He will deliver me from the hand of of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. What was this, Pastor? A miracle. This was a miracle. This was him doing something that is not normal in the course of normal nature. You don't grab a bear. Listen, you don't grab a bear with your bare hands, nor a lion with your bare hands, and kill him, not without some supernatural intervention. So this is a miracle in the life of David. Go to Judges. Let's go over here, back up. Let's go to the time of the judges in the Old Testament. You're still with me, right? Yes. Book of Judges. Say, praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. We're going to see another one. This is so powerful. When you understand this working of miracles, it is awesome to understand of the very thing that God's talking about relating to me and you. So if you turn over, I head over to the book of Judges, chapter 15. Judges 15. How many remember Samson? Samson, uh, you know, a lot of people think of Samson, he had to be, you know, just in our picture of our minds because of his strength. He had to be this really big guy. But, you know, I heard a minister say this one time. He said, I don't believe that was true of Samson because if Samson was this really massive, really strong guy, then it certainly wouldn't have looked like the Lord gave him the strength. That it was his own strength. It would make far more sense for God to use a guy like my size to do what Samson did. Why? Because from the perspective of the natural, you ain't strong enough to do that. But God. But God. Through working of miracles, guess what God can do? Intervene in the natural course of life supernaturally. So in, in this case, Samson literally had gone, off, gone after the Philistines for burning to death, his wife, his son, 
and his father-in-law. After they did this, he went after them. He slew many of them. Down here in uh, Judges 15, verse 8 and 9, talks about him in uh, verse 7, actually taking revenge on them and slewing many of them. Uh, verse 8, attacked them, uh, had a great slaughter. And then verse 9, and, and he, uh, verse 8, b- bottom part of verse 8, he went then up to the rock of Edom. And then in verse 9, the Philistines went up and camped against Judah. So now he's gone after slewing a bunch of, he goes up to this rock in Edom. And what do the Philistines do? Well, they can't find him. So guess who they go after? They go after the tribe of Judah. They go and camp against Judah. And Judah's like, well, what do you got against us? We haven't done anything to you. We're here trying to find Samson. Where is he? And they want to know because now clearly they've had so many that he's killed. They want to take care of him and get him out of the way. And if you drop down here to verse 14, after they told him, well, he's up, you know, he's up at the, uh, up at the rock of Edom. So they go there. Notice this, verse 14, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him, Samson, underline it, and the spirit of the Lord did what? Came mightily upon him. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. You listening? For the Spirit of the Lord to come on you mighty like this and do what he did, this is God intervening supernaturally in the natural. See, for God, this isn't a supernatural event. For man, it is. God's a supernatural God. So for him, it's just a normal, everyday thing for him in the sense of what he could do any day. But for man, this is not normal. This is a miracle. So the Spirit of the Lord came, notice again, mightily upon him, and he did what? And notice the ropes that were on him that they had tied him with on his arms. They became like flax that is burned with fire, and his, uh, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. 15, he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. A jawbone of a donkey. A jawbone of a donkey. He reached out his hand, he took it, and he killed a thousand men with it. So when's the last time you've ever seen a guy with a jawbone of a donkey kill a thousand men? Now realize, these were fighting men. These ain't a bunch of sissies. Philistines knew how to fight. But what happened? The Spirit of the Lord came on him mightily. You listening? 16, then Samson said, with a jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with a jawbone of a donkey, underline, I have slain a thousand men. A thousand men. With one jawbone of a donkey. You don't do that normally. There's no way in the natural you could do that. Unless, unless God. Right? Working of miracles. We see no exercising of Samson's, of a faith here that God gave Samson to believe for something. No. Samson just did what? He just felt the presence of the Lord come on him. He finds his jawbone. He goes after these boys. And he actually sees a miracle happen. And he kills a thousand men. Tell me that isn't amazing. Mark chapter 6. So many different instances you can show of working of miracles throughout the Bible. There are many. There are many. So as you read the Bible now, what are we learning about to be able to develop a better understanding, not be uh, ignorant of these gifts? Understanding what they actually are, and therefore knowing their aspect of how they're defined, recognizing them in the Bible. Recognizing them in the Bible. What's a, what's a miracle? Supernatural intervention by God in the ordinary course of nature. We've seen two already. You don't normally kill a bear and a lion, but the Lord. You don't normally, you don't, nobody, you don't slew a thousand men with one jawbone, but the Lord. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 6. There's many instances in Jesus' life. He didn't do this again because he was God in flesh. He was God in flesh. But he was living on the, fa- on the face of the planet as the Son of Man. Functioning as a man. Of course, God working through him, just like he will us. In Mark 6, 34, notice this. Jesus, when he came out, he saw this great multitude. And he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. What was he moved with compassion for them about? Because they're like sheep, not having what? So he began to teach them many things. I'm going to tell you what. God is so moved with compassion today. He looks at all these children of his that just will not go and find a shepherd. And it truly breaks his heart that they are sheep without a shepherd. 35. When the day was now far spent. So he's, the day was what? What did he do all day? He sat there and taught them all day long. They didn't get bored. Right? 
Well, if Jesus would show up in our church and teach us, do you know I believe this? If Jesus showed up in some churches and started teaching, some after a couple hours would say, I got to go. Seriously, I believe it. Well, I'm, I got stuff to do. Man. I got to go. I wish he'd have kind of planned a better time for us to have this meeting, you know. Seriously. Because if you're sitting in a church hearing the word preached, guess who's talking to you? Jesus is. So the day, verse 35, was far spent, and his disciples came to him, and they said, hey, this is a deserted place. There ain't no McDonald's. Ain't no Taco Bell. Goodman's. There ain't no, it's one of their favorite places. No, Taco Bueno. Hey, does anybody remember going to Taco Bell when you were a kid? It used to be good. I don't don't go there. Is it good? Does anybody go? No, I see it. No, I think it's like a mystery meet now. Right. Who knows what it is? You don't want me to get, you don't want me to get started on McDonald's hamburgers. <laughs> I'm going to mess with some of you then, so you'll be upset. Well, I like McDonald's hamburgers, so I won't say anything about that. But there was no place for them to get food. It's a deserted place. It's already the hour is late, right? And, and sadly, you know, they didn't have a Josh Grimes there with the smoker, a Rectech smoker, you know, and a bunch of brisket on a grill, you know, to cook for them. I think, by the way, just so you know, we're going to plan another fall outreach I haven't talked to him yet, but see, I'm already putting him in the, in, I'm already putting the pressure on him, all ready to, to cook for us. I mean, I think we'll do a fall get together, right? I think we need to get back to uh, some real good competition on some uh, wait cornhole cornhole contest. Yeah, give some awards away and see if we can't get some ladies to win this year. Thirty six, send them away. What are the disciples saying? Jesus, come on! There's so many people. We got no way to feed them. You, you got to send them away now. They got to go. You've been teaching them all day, I know, but, you know, we can't feed them. You got to send them away so they can get something to eat. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. 37, he answered and he said to them, you give them something to eat. That's something. Would you imagine going to Jesus? I think about this stuff all the time. As a teacher, this stuff just stands out to me. They walk up, you know, Jesus, hey, come on. We understand you've been teaching all day, but we got nothing to feed them. It's time to send them away, Lord. Time to send them somewhere to get something to eat. And what does Jesus do? He turns around and says, you feed them. Right. Us? Yeah, you feed them. You go take care of them. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? How much money do they have on them? 200 denarii. Yeah. Right. We got that much. But even if we went and bought that much, now guess what? In this setting, there's over 5,000 people here. So they're not going to be able to buy enough. 38, he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Remember what Kathy gave you a little exhortation on the other day? Yes. What do you have? Right. Yes. Offer it to God and watch God do something with it. Amen. Can I get a better amen? amen? Well, they found out that they said we have five uh, loaves and we have these two fish. And he commanded them to do what? Make them all sit down and what? Groups on the green grass. All of you people in this church need to understand verse 39 is a ministry of helps verse. Yes, Come on. You listening? Yes. Jesus didn't make them sit down. He's the, he's the one ministering to them. I need you to actually get them all broken up in groups and sit them down and organize them. Ministry of helps. Verse 40. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, what did he do? He looks to the Father. He looks to heaven. He blessed and broke the loaves and he gave them to his disciples to set before them and the two fish he divided among them. Now, there's no multiplication yet. No, he just hands them back what he gave thanks to the Father for. Because again, people want to see the multiplication first. Okay, now, man, look at this, guys. It's just multiplying. Come on, let's start getting it distributed as quick as we can because it just keeps multiplying. It didn't happen that way. Because you know why? Faith don't work that way. You have to act upon what God's told you to do. And when you act, guess what happens? The miracle happens. The multiplication, the multiplication comes. I could only imagine the look on their face. Come on. Come on. Could you see Peter? How about doubting Thomas? He probably nugged and Peter said, this is going to be good. See all those guys? We're about to be killed, man. They are not going to be happy when we run out within the first handful of people what little bit of loaves and fish we have. You ready to die? <laughs> Come on, you got no Thomas, man. He wasn't positive in the situation. You listening? Yeah. You know what Peter would have said, though? 
Shut up, Thomas. I don't know what's going to happen. All I know is Jesus told us to do it. We're going to go do it. At least Peter was bold enough to answer, uh, to, uh, excuse me, to respond to do what Jesus told him. Amen. Thank you for all your amens about that. Amen. So notice this, verse 39. So they commanded them to sit him down. 40, they sat down in ranks. 41, he had taken the five loaves, offered up to God, gave thanks, gave it to the disciples, divided what little bit they had amongst those disciples. 42, so they all ate and were filled. Right. This isn't like... Well, you know, one, one, one crazy, crazy, you know, minister back in the day said, well, you know, they, they broke the fish up into little tiny bits, little tiny pieces, and the bread, little, that's not going to fill you up. Most of your kids would complain in this church. That's all you're giving me, Mom? That's it. Come on, I'm hungry. <laughs> Are you listening? That wouldn't have filled them up. But they were all what? Tell me out loud. Shout it at me one time. Like you're excited to be in church. 43. And they did what? They even took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of fish. 12 baskets. They started with five and two. And they've got 12 baskets left over after everybody's rubbing their belly and say, Oh, man, was that a great meal or what? You listening? Verse 44, now these who had eaten, were uh, the loaves were about how many? Tell me out loud. So 5,000 men, these are families. 5,000 men, most of them married, have a, have a wife. That's 10,000. What about kids? And how many of you adults, how many of your kids eat more than you? Raise your hand if that's true. See, So think about how much the kids ate. We're not even talking about the 10,000 adults. Come on, somebody. What is this? You need to understand the gifts to see them function in your life as you read the Bible to define what that is. That's a working of miracles. This is God intervening supernaturally in the natural course of nature to do a supernatural work. Say gifts, excuse me, say working of miracles. One more, can you do one more? In this category, Acts chapter 9. We're not done yet tonight, but I want to go one more here. In this category, Acts chapter 9. So let's see one of the disciples do a working of miracles. Now, how do these actual gifts of the Spirit manifest as the Spirit wills? Jesus, I guarantee, he said, I don't do anything except what I see the Father do. do, I don't really honestly believe Jesus knew that they were going to multiply. I just believe he said, he, he said again, I don't do anything except what I see the Father do. So as he turns to the Father, what are you supposed to do? What did the Father say? The Father said, just take what you got and offer it up to me and give me thanks and give it back to your disciples. Have it distributed. Right. So that's what he did. I don't think he was shocked by it because he said, that's my, that's my God, it's my Father. He can do anything he wants. Amen. I knew he was going to do something. Yeah. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Acts chapter 9. You still with me? Verse 36, Acts 9, 36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. How many, how many moms are going to name your next daughter Dorcas? No, no Dorcases? Huh? No Dorcases. You know what Dorcas means? Gazelle. It means gazelle. Hey, Dorcas. This woman was what? She was full of what? Tell me out loud. She was full of good works and charitable deeds which she did say that was good with God notice but it happened in those days that she became sick and died when they washed her they laid her in an upper room and since Lydia uh, excuse me since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there they sent two men to him imploring him not to delay in coming to them now that's kind of funny don't delay in coming she's already passed away I mean, the quicker you get there, it's not going to make that big of a difference. She's already passed away. But that's how people in the natural look at it. Verse 39, Peter then arose. He went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. All the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter did what? What did he do? Tell me what he did. Now see, this is now a leading of the Holy Spirit to get all this unbelief out of the room. Yeah, but they're weeping and crying. Yeah, and that's going to cause him to be hindered in a position to be able to see God manifest miraculously if he doesn't do what? Get all this unbelief out of the room. You listening? So notice he put them all out. He knelt down and he prayed. How many of you think that would be a good idea? See, he's got to seek from God what God wants to do here. 
He doesn't know that God wants to raise her from the dead. He's got to talk to God to find out. So he prayed and then, notice he then turned to the body. So he's heard from God. Say he heard from God. And what did he do? So this is how God released a miracle through him by telling him what to do. He said, Tabitha, arise. You don't do that with everybody unless God tells you to do it. Can I get a better amen? And she did what? She opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she did what? Now, I want to read the rest here and come back. Then he gave her his hand. He lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. It became known. How many think it would have? It became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed. Underline it again. They believed on what? Why did they believe on the Lord? Because they saw the Father. They saw the Father. They saw the Father revealed. Right? Jesus said, it's not me that does the works, the Father in me. Same with us. Back to 40. So Peter, this is what I want you to get. Peter put them all out. All Peter knows at this point is, don't misunderstand this. Peter doesn't know he, he, that she's going to be raised from the dead. He don't know that. He's not God. I said, he's not God. I learned this through Brother Hagin. Brother Hagin said, I have gone to different times in different situations with different people and dealing with the same matter that I've dealt with before, but I always take time to pray because I don't know what God wants to do. And I don't know what God needs me to do in that situation, but he does know what he needs to do based on that individual. If God doesn't give me anything, and not in relationship to somebody dead, talking about healing, if God doesn't give me anything, as I told you, he shares the word with them and gets their faith in the word. This is how you operate in the gifts of the Spirit. How? You got to take time. In this situation, they're asking you to come because she's died. So what do you got to do? You got to seek God and find out, does he want to raise her from the dead? This may shock you. But you know, there was a gal that uh, Dr. Summerall knew that was in his church, and her husband died at an early age. And I, I don't mean like God took him because of a disease or a sickness. He just happened, he wasn't actually in the case of what he was in, in the situation he was in, he didn't die of a sickness or disease, he just left his body. And she cried out to God, so this is unfair. This ain't right. I don't get it. She goes to Summerall, and she said to her pastor, I don't get it. Why did God take him early? And he said, did you ever stop to think that maybe... That if God didn't take him now, he could turn back to sin and not go to heaven? She said, really? He said, I'll pray about it. He came back and he said, that's exactly what the Lord said. The Lord said he was ready. He's been an absolute sinner up until this time. He had just given his life to the Lord. And now is the time to take him home. Because if I didn't, guess what? He could have turned back to sin. See, people don't believe this because they believe once saved, always saved. Go read Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 says you cannot, after being born again, continue in an act of willful sin and re-crucify the Lord of glory. You're going to stand a strict judgment. Now, that's willful sin. You listening? That's choosing to go back to a lifestyle of sin that you know is wrong, but you choose to do so. And I heard Brother Hagin say the same thing about others that he knew in the situation of his father-in-law. He wanted to see his father-in-law healed, but he didn't get healed. And the Lord told him, don't you pray for his healing. Why? I'm bringing him home. And the cool part about it was he didn't even die from the sickness and disease. It didn't take his life. The last couple days he was with him, he he kept, he turned to, he actually turned to Brother Hagin. That's what I love about knowing about Coy. Coy knew he was going to heaven. Now, Coy just wore his heart out, but he knew seven days, ten days before that, I think. He was going to heaven, kept saying things. But the, his name was uh, Mr. Rooker, and he, he turned to Kenneth. He said, Kenneth, he said, I'm, I'm dying. He said, I know it, Mr. Rooker. He said, I'm going to heaven. He said, I know that too. He said, there's been a man, Kenneth, right up there in the corner this whole time telling me he's come to get me, and he's here to take me back, but I told him I'm not ready to go yet. Hadn't seen all his family. So they brought all of his family in the next day. After seeing all of his family, and he left. He's alone with him again in the room. And he, open, and he wakes up again. And he looks up. And he said, uh, he's here, Kenneth. I'm going with him. He said, well, Brother Rooker, just set your head back on the pillow and go, man. Yeah. And he did. But he talked to the Lord. He said, why couldn't I pray for him for his healing? He said, because his life was now ready. He was ready to go home. Come be with me. He's lived a sinful life. You know, over this last year, he's been walking with me. And now is the time to take him home so he doesn't turn his heart back to the world. That's a gracious God. God knows the hearts of all men. I said, God knows the hearts of all men. I'm bringing all that to say, Peter didn't know what to do here. He shows up thinking, I'm probably going to have to comfort these people. 
right? But he gets them out of the room. I need to talk to God. Say, I need to talk to God. So what does he do? He gets down and he prays. Why? Why would he be praying? God, what do you want to do here? You don't know. You don't know what he's going to do. Right? Right? He didn't know this is going to be a working of miracles. Man, we're all going to be shouting and praising God here in a minute because we're going to raise her from the dead. He don't know that. That's why he prayed. But I'll guarantee you how he knew what to do, Tabitha arise, because he heard from God. Peter was led by the Holy Spirit. You want to walk in the gifts of the Spirit? You don't figure out what's going to happen. You're tuned into God's channel and say, God, what do you want to do here? And when you obey God, if he wants to work a miracle, guess what? He'll work a miracle. And Miss Gazelle, Dorcas, means Gazelle, she came back to life. I said, Miss Gazelle, her name Dorcas, or Dorcas means Gazelle, she came back to life. I want you to get this point. I said, I want you to get this point. I said, I want you to get this point. This is how these things function. As the Spirit wills. How do we know? We tune into the Holy Spirit. He showed up. There's no acknowledgement when he's on his way there saying, Don't worry, I'll raise her from the dead. No problem. He didn't know that. I said, He doesn't know that. He just goes to find out what does God want me to do here. He obviously had to have a witness from the Holy Spirit to even go. We want to talk about this. If you want to function in the gifts of the Spirit, you got to learn to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. He's not going to let you just go out and do what you want to do and use you. He's got to have you able to be able to listen to him to be directed by him. Yes. Right? Yes. Peter could have said, Peter didn't go to everybody, I'll guarantee you, that said, hey, could you come? He couldn't have. Mm-hmm. Jesus couldn't even. What's he got to do? Find out, if he, does the Lord want me to go? So when he gets there, though, what does he do again? Are you still here? You're awful quiet. Yes. I'm trying to help you understand how these things function. So what did he do? He knelt down and prayed. Why do you pray? Why do you pray? Is he, is he praying to have God raise him from raise her for the dead? No. He's saying, God, what do you want to do here? Because if God's going to raise him, raise her from the dead, he's got to hear from God. He wants to do that. Amen. You're finding out, God, what you're not God. You don't go to God and say, Oh God, raise him from the dead. You listening? What do you do? All you do is, is simply tune into God. God, what do you want to do here? So God speaks to him. And he tells her, speak to her, Tabitha, arise. And he did. And guess what she did? She arose. She arose. And we see a working of miracles. miracles. I'll give you an example in functioning context of uh, even gifts of healings. Brother Hagen, one time, was called on by some friends to go to a house. Minister's wife was lying there. Uh, dying of cancer, little of nothing left on her body, just pretty much skin and bones. They asked her to come, asked him to come and minister to her. He had a witness to go. He said, yeah, I'll come. So he went, they were traveling, and they got to the house, and he said, all the time before I minister to anybody, I tune in to God. I find out, God, is there something you want to do specific here? If not, then I'm going to start sharing the Word. Right. I'm going to tell him what the Word says. Amen. She can be healed because the Word says so. Preaching better than your amen. amen. So he showed up and he said, I'll always take time to pray in the spirit. What are you doing? You're tuning into, tuning into God's channel. A lot of people don't understand. God has no problem speaking to you. We have a problem listening. You got to tune into his channel. If you're, if you're, if you're fi- focusing all of your attention of your mind on carnal things, guess what you're not tuned into? God's channel. And you have a hard time following God. We're going to get into this uh, probably Sunday night of how to get into these gifts and flow in these gifts. So clearly, what we got to understand, like Brother Hagin knew, is I got to tune into God and say, God, do you want to do anything here? And in this case, as he's sitting there praying, the Lord told him, he said, he was standing at the foot of the bed, or at the head of the bed. Go down, stand at the foot of the bed. He said, I want you to speak to that spirit affair. I want you to command it to come out in Jesus' name. So he did. He walked down the foot of the bed. And I mean, at this time, uh, there was other there, other, as well as his wife, all praying in the Spirit. He goes down at the end of the bed. He stands. He said, when I got to the end of the bed, nobody saw me. Their all eyes closed praying in the Spirit. When I got to the end of the bed, guess what they all just simultaneously did? They stopped praying in the Spirit. Yeah. And he immediately said, I command you, Spirit of fear, come out of her in the name of Jesus. Guy standing next to him said, I told him this later. I saw something dark come out of her and it went right between us and went right out that window. And the moment he said that, she rose up out of that bed and said, I'm healed. Amen. Hallelujah. And she jumped out of bed that day and she ate water, well, at watermelon with him that afternoon out in the backyard. Hallelujah. And was cancer free. Glory to God. 
Now, you don't go to everybody and do that that has cancer. He didn't do that with everybody. You got to tune into the Holy Spirit. He said that I went to another lady, almost similar situation, similar type of cancer. The Lord didn't tell me to do that. Didn't tell me to do anything like that. And I'm sitting there asking the Lord, what do I need to do? Nothing came. Nothing came. So you know what I know to do? Share the word. Just share the word. If they'll receive it, it'll work. Can I get a better amen? So understand, this is how we function in these gifts. By learning to do what? Listen to the Holy Spirit. So working in miracles is a, say it, supernatural Supernatural. intervention Intervention. by God. In the ordinary course of nature. Ordinary course of nature. Sunday, gifts of inspiration. We'll go over prophecy, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Stand your feet. Did you learn anything tonight? We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.